Good afternoon. I am a lecturer at Northern Caribbean University in Mandeville. Thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. Say something. <laughs> oh, she presented earlier too. Right. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Youth pastor. Okay. Yes. And a banker. All right. Youth pastor and banker. Teacher at Manchester High School. Okay. <laughs> Um, Teddy Beer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Associate Pastor, First Assembly. Guidance Counselor, Wilmer's Girls. I'm in ministry at First Assembly. I'm the secretary and also counselor. First Assembly in Mandeville, all the way from Cool Cool Mandeville. Come on, make like a nice there, no? <laughs> Ryan Bailey, Guidance Counselor at Portland the High School. All right, we have the first question that came up. What if you are going to school and you are in a class where you're alone as a Christian, or seem to be alone, and the children deliberately take it on you to make you lose your salvation? What would you do? Panelists at your function. Right. I haven't been in a situation where I have personally been antagonized that much in high school. I think it happens a lot more perhaps now. But um, there's this little song that Dolly McClurkin sings that says, what do you do when you've done all you can and it seems like there is never enough? You just stand. If you're having that kind of difficulty, make up in your God-filled mind <laughs> that you're going to serve God and stand for him no matter what. You're going to find that some of those people who are taunting you, they are testing to see whether or not you are sure of yourself and sure of your Christianity. Some of them are coming back around to you for some answers in a very short time. All right, and remember that Jesus Christ said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. You say, for great is your reward in heaven. So if people are doing anything to persecute you as a child of God, rejoice. Great is your reward and stand for your faith. And everyone that wants to live righteous will be persecuted. Amen. Next question. How do you change what is happening in your life? when you are comfortable with it and you know that God is not right with and you know it's not right with God how do you change what's happening in your life when you are comfortable with it and you know that it's not right with God bless God um, first and foremost stop being comfortable with it stop being comfortable with it one if it's not comfortable with God and I'm presuming that you, you're seeking after God and you want, you want God's what, his presence to be with you. Stop being comfortable with it. Can I give you a little pass pass but not tell nobody, you know. That all right? So on the fast, you see everybody jump up and say it. But, all right. Now, I know a young man that the, every, every, every service keep in their church, right at the altar, you know. Singing, shouting, and a service over, in the other girl yard. Well, he was not singing. There's a lot of shouting was going on, but that's for another top. But one day, that young man decided that, listen, enough is enough. Because he was being a hypocrite. You can imagine one day the girl looked at him and said, but may I ask you something? When you invite me to church. That was 1998 before I went to Bible college. I thank God that he so awesome. That, that day I said, listen, enough is enough. I stopped being comfortable with it. And I walked out of it and started to please God. Walk out of it. Amen. All right. I'm going to direct this question to Pastor. Is it Pastor Dunbar? Because I know this is your special area. Um, the question says, it's a little bit open, but let me ask it anyway. Is oral sex wrong? Because I don't think it is if you are married. And the only thing I think could change my mind is Bible evidence. 
as in the marriage, the bed is undefiled. Seeing you have already drawn your own conclusion as to what is right and what is not. Uh, you have really quoted a scripture, and that's the scripture, that's how it is. The marriage bed is undefiled. As to whether or not oral sex um, is wrong within the context of marriage, I will tell you that whatever impedes the tenderness of your conscience, that to you is sin. Right? And if it is that you are questioning the efficacy of what you're thinking, then I think you need to stay away from it. All right. Can we have a question from the, the audience now? Yes, a hand is right there. If you have a boyfriend in your class and you want to study on your work, but he's always on your mind, what should you do? Could you repeat that question? Um, I'm not sure the panel, panelists heard the question. Just speak a little louder. Um, to Mr. Bailey, if you have a boyfriend in your class and you want to study on your work, but he's always on your mind, what should you do? Or you have a boyfriend in your class and he's always on your mind and you can't focus on your work, what should you do? Let's direct this to someone who hasn't answered yet. Um, you want to take that one, Pastor? Pastor Riley? At this time, at this point in your life, you have to set some priorities. Right now, you're not getting ready to get married. He has no job because you're both in class. So since he's distracting you from what should be your priorities, maybe the boyfriend needs to go and then the, you stick with the studies so that you can become what God is calling you to be. All right, thank you. Now, I have another question here, and I really think that um, we really need to be praying for our young people because um, they, we ended the last section on um, a note where we were very um, conscious of what's happening in terms of suicide. And I have another question here that's related to that. And um, for some of us who wonder how could someone contemplate taking their lives, a lot of our young people are in situations like those. It says, what if you have been sexually abused and this has affected you mentally, emotionally, and physically to the point where you have given up on life, contemplating suicide, and turning to homosexuality. What advice would you have for such a person? Okay. Whatever you have gone through in life does not determine who you are as a person. Whether you're being abused sexually, emotionally, mentally, that does not say that that is the plan of God for your life. You can turn around, say to yourself that, listen, I am worth more than this. Even though I've been abused, I am worth more than this. And get up and move on. Don't allow that to determine that because I'm abused, I'm a victim. And you use that to carry it, to determine where you go. No, you're not a victim. Move out of it. Thank you. I think the guidance council has a take on that. I it, it's, it's a serious situation. Um, I think I have dealt with something similar. What we need to do is to create a new environment for ourselves. We have to find ourselves with people who call on the Lord of a, out of a pure heart. Um, Paul said to Timothy that flee the youthful loss and the evil desires of youth and pursue, which means to go after um, God with people who call on God out of a pure heart. If you know that you have been abused, you have been, been, been molested. You cannot sit there and wallow in self-pity and, 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 and talk to people or associate yourself with people who are not able to help you. Find somebody who you can trust, somebody you can talk to, listen to some music, find some enjoyment that can keep you alive and keep, your, and keep you focused on something that is wholesome and healthy. Thank you. Would you allow me to also make a mention on something about this? Uh, I think it's also important to make reference to scriptures. Uh, if you see Mary Magdalene, seven demons were cast off her, which means the demons were messing her up. But when she found Jesus, she was freed. There are a lot, many people also like that. So what you should do is to relate to Jesus and be closer to Jesus and begin to confess the word of God of who you really are now. 
Can I just start, uh, start by saying, do you know the popular uh, minister, woman minister, uh, 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 that we, all, we always see on television from the U.S.? All right? She was molested. But if you see her ministry is worldwide and the audience is so large, Joyce she's Myers. Joyce Myers. All right? Praise God. I believe you just need to see yourself as God sees you. It doesn't matter what you have been through. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Place the same amount of value that God has placed on you, on yourself. Uh, I just want to quickly add to that too. I think underneath some of this quest, a lot of these questions, and it seemed like it's coming from a male, and we have to admit that a lot of our young men have been um, abused sexually. And I think at the heart of it also is a question of, did God fail me? Is somehow the devil so much stronger than God that he's, he can't really come and deliver me? But um, the bottom line is God didn't promise us that we would not go through some of these physical stuff. He did not promise that we would never go through anything physical or any abuse. And so the reality is that we have to ask him to give us that strength inside to deal with it and to, uh, like um, Mr. Ryan Bailey said, find others who can strengthen you. Find a community of persons that can strengthen you. Stay away from the community of persons that sing in the blues and feeling sorry for themselves and find a set of people that can encourage and, and help disciple you to make you see who you are in God. We get this question at almost every conference. And I would say something that Bishop Carlin really encouraged me um, to push out to you if you were raped and molested innocently it is not your fault you still in God's eyes you still have your purity and the only way you don't have your purity is if you have hate in your heart and I said this at Hilda's last year one of my girls was raped on a taxi and I teach forgiveness I teach how to deal with tough times and I'm here counseling this child and she's crying and I'm feeling upset and angry. And I look at this young lady and she said, Miss, I was saving myself and the driver took me off. I was the last one in the taxi and he raped me. And I, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit came and I said, well, baby, guess what? God is in control. And I said, what do you want to do? And she began to pray for him. And she said, Lord, please save his soul. And the Holy Spirit said to me, this girl is pure. She has her purity. And I looked at her and I said, baby, you have your purity. And she just began to smile. That was the breaking of the yoke from her life. Nobody else could tell her after that that she didn't have her purity. She heard God in her spirit. So if it was not your fault, baby, trust me. You have your purity if you choose to forgive. And hold your head up. And if you need to get a counseling, we have counselors here. Look for those with the badges and get help. We're here for you today. We only have time for one more question. Um, final question. I think I'll pose this to Miss um, Mullins. I haven't heard from you. If you have a boyfriend and you plan to have sex and you end up pregnant, will abortion be necessary? Are you to keep the baby? What should you do? Well, first of all, two wrongs don't make a right. And if you, if you got pregnant, are you listening? Right, if you got pregnant, um, whether it was your fault or not your fault, going, going the way of, of killing the baby or what we call murder, it's, it's still sin. There are other options that are available. There's adoption. There's, there's so many other ways that are available. There's help available for young people who have, who have gotten pregnant, who have, who have babies. There are many, many facilities available for you. So going the way of abortion is never, never, never the answer. There's so much danger to an abortion. Some, some people never recover from it mentally. Physically, their bodies never recover. They can't have children again. There's so much danger to that. So two wrongs don't make a right if you're already pregnant. You know, go and get help. See counsel. Go to your guidance counsel. Go to your parents. Some of you may not feel that you can. Still go to your parents, and there's always another way out. 
before you even decide to go think about abortion, we need to, dis first of all, the decision has to be made, don't go down that street at all. You don't have to have sex. You can keep yourself holy and pure for God. And some people can say, well, yes, I can do that. Well, you all say you can do that. You're married. I was a holy virgin when I got married. It, and I didn't marry the first man that I dated. I dated holy. Things have changed, times have changed. But it was what it was. I had friends that got pregnant. So it wasn't that I could not have. It's a decision that you have to make. I choose. You have to say to yourself and say to God, I choose that I will not have sex before I get married. And that's just a decision you have to take. And I will say this, one thing, it's, if you have messed up, God can forgive any kind of sin. God will forgive sin. So that's not it, and God will clean you up. You don't have to go down that road again. But it's a beautiful thing when a couple comes together in marriage and they haven't touched each other beforehand because they can and truly enjoy each other in the beauty of holiness the way that God intended it. So rather than decide to go down the road and if I might have this or if this might happen, choose not to go down that street at all. Stay holy, stay passionate, stay pure for God, and watch God use your life as an example to other young people. Come on, put your hands together for our panel. We want to thank you very much for coming, for sharing. We always have more questions than we can handle. So we, we thank you. Give the Lord a praise for them.